Welcome to all. Thank you for joining us at the SG Tech Go International webinar series on entering China. My name is Ying Ying. I'm part of the SG Tech Secretariat leading internationalization. Our team looks at helping SG Tech members go overseas through leading business missions and organizing of trade fairs. If this is something of interest to you, do remember to fill up our survey so that we can better curate activities to suit your needs. By providing us with the information, regarding your markets of interest, we can help you um, design better activities to see your needs. A gentle reminder that this webinar will be recorded and uploaded onto Azure Chat's website and also the YouTube channel. There will be a live Q&A session for both speakers after the second speaker has finished his presentation. So before we begin the webinar proper, let's welcome Mr. Yu Sikiet, Executive Director of Azure Chat to open this session. Mr. Yeo, please. Thank you, Yingying. Uh, thank you, everybody. Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for taking time off uh, to participate in this uh, very early webinar, one of the earliest we have actually done, as I understand from the team. My pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event on Go International Entering China. Uh, to our old friends, existing members of SG Tech, it is nice to actually have you with us again. Uh, to our new friends who are unfamiliar with SG Tech, let me give you a brief introduction of who we are. We are a trade association, as Ying Ying mentioned, setting up to represent and champion the interests of the tech industry in Singapore with a rapid, within a rapidly evolving technology landscape. We strive to create an ecosystem that anticipates trends, develop sustainably, sustainable initiatives to strengthen and grow the industry. Today, we have close to a thousand members, ranging from startups to SMEs to MNC, MNCs, and to coordinate the needs of subsectors within the ICT space, we also have industry chapters and committees supporting strategic and emerging sectors. Examples of this include cloud, uh, AI, uh, high performance computing, and even um, to areas of uh, smart nations and data centers. As an example of a recent initiative that we did uh, for the industry, when the circuit breaker happens abruptly, many of us were caught by surprise at how fast the COVID-19 situation has escalated. And most of us were actually not ready to work from home. As a trade association that actually champions digitalization, we decisively put together resources almost overnight to, pre to present to the industry the Isolation Economy Webinar Series, Solutions Toolbox, as well as to actually conduct a COVID-19 ICT industry survey. All these feedbacks were useful and were shared with agencies uh, prior for them to plan their uh, next steps to actually engage the economy. The webinar series covered topics close to business owners' hearts and achieved its intent to support companies in the implementation of remote working. The solution toolbox, which compiled the technology tools to empower companies to tackle challenge of working from home, was well received. Indeed, as we have found out through our survey, 80% of the companies did not have regular commuting practices and were the loss of bringing an entire business online within such a short uh, time frame. These survey findings were represented uh, within, within to the relevant government agencies, such as Enterprise Singapore, such as INDA, which in turn aided in crafting some of the government policies. Now, to the Go International series, we begin to restart life in phase two just recently, right, in the safe transition period. We want to bring internationalization back to the table. Market diversification is important for protecting business bottom lines against region-specific events. It is also helpful for gaining access to valuable talent. The Go International Webinar Series aims to help fellow ICT companies learn about navigating different territories. We will be working with different consultants and partners, as some of them you have seen here today, right, to actually present bite-sized content fortnightly that uh, all the participants can action upon. Thank you to uh, Dizan Shira as well as uh, CBC uh, in uh, raising this uh, auspicious uh, occasion with us together. My concluding remarks, I am confident that the curated series of Go International will be able to help you learn more about doing business overseas. I believe very soon as a group, we'll be able to meet physically, network in person, and travel to go global together. Thank you very much once again for your support for SG Tech and our partners, and I look forward to working closely with all of you. Thanks, Ying. Over to you. 
Thank you, Mr. Yeo, for the visionary and inspiring opening remarks. First up, we will have Adam from Design Shira and Associates to share with us. Adam is actually currently based in Dalian. He's a partner at Design Shira and Associates and has been living in China for the past 16 years. He speaks also fluent Dongbeihua. His area of specialization include HR, accounting, and FDI into China. Prior to this, Adam has also experienced working with Indian and Japanese companies. Today, Adam will be briefing us on the ICT landscape in China, as well as the technical aspects into government restrictions, as well as tax benefits pertaining ICT companies in China. Let's welcome Adam, please. Thank you very much, Yin Ying. Um, okay, I'm just uh, gonna try and share my screen here. One second, everyone. Okay, here's my presentation today. Thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, the title is the IT, ICT Market Overview in China and Opportunities for Foreign Investors. Uh, myself and my colleague Thomas will be speaking for maybe about 20 minutes today and uh, we hope you find the presentation interesting. Okay. Um, first of all, a little bit very quickly about uh, our company, Desen Shira and Associates, established in 1992. And we have around 300 employees in our, in our team. As Ying Yun was just explaining there, we are focusing on various areas relating to uh, compliance, advisory, uh, across, uh, across the scope of uh, areas. And um, yeah, uh, we're basically uh, helping foreign companies enter Asian markets. Uh, we have around 2,000 multinational clients, um, come from all countries. And uh, as you can see in the, the bottom here, we have 24 offices, including one in Singapore as well. So we're in a good position to help Singapore companies going into not only China, but uh, especially India, Vietnam, and other ASEAN countries. Our service suite is uh, effectively these eight areas here. Uh, I'll just allow you to look at those very quickly. I won't go through them. Uh, as you can see though in the bottom right hand corner, one of our areas of uh, focus at the moment is uh, IT and ERP. Um, so this is uh, something we, uh, we think is underpinning it. the rest of our, our services at the moment. It's a, it's a focus for us and a little bit of a uh, uh, focus for the topics today as well. And uh, we have two speakers today. One of them is uh, me, of course. I'm one of the equity partners at Desen Shira. Uh, I'm based in Dalian, northeastern China, um, and uh, Thomas is the second speaker. Thomas actually reports into me, uh, and because he does that and he manages our IT team, I uh, have to get involved in a lot of these IT issues. So while I'm not a particular IT specialist myself, uh, I am uh, basically involved in quite a lot these days. Uh, Thomas himself, he's based in Shenzhen. Uh, he'll be speaking a little bit today. And I'll also ask him to answer any difficult questions that arise from the audience uh, if, if they come along. Um, he's helping us with uh, our in IT infrastructure, of course, managing that with all those offices that we have around multiple countries. Uh, we're also developing various applications, but we're also providing services to clients. So Thomas has a team of people under him doing all of that. Here's the contents for today. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to give everybody a market overview. Um, talking about the upwardly trending sectors in China's ICT market. Uh, after that, we'd like to, to explain some of the common regulatory challenges. Uh, I'm going to hand over Tom to Thomas for, for that portion there. Uh, and then afterwards, we want to focus on a few specific subsectors, um, looking at cloud computing, online education, and ICT enabled hospitality. Um, why we choose these subsectors, uh, the reason is that one is uh, rather a difficult one for foreign investment. Uh, the second one is complex but possible and the third one is relatively straightforward although there's still things to to consider so we want to give you a comparison there um, and finally we'll talk a little bit about tax incentives for high-tech companies coming into china so let's move on to the first section then the upwardly trending sectors worldwide in 2020 uh, first of all i'd like to look at worldwide and then focus in on china for this theme, what I thought I would use as the, uh, the background is a Financial Times survey that was released uh, about a week ago, 
uh, and they examined the top 100 companies in the world which managed to increase their market cap over the past six months. Of course, the, the past six months of COVID effectively. Um, and this is what they found. Uh, actually, the, the, of these top 100 companies, 24 of them were in the information technology sector. 12 of them were in communication services and 19 of them were in what we call consumer discretionary. Uh, that's for instance, Amazon, you can think of it, Alibaba, these kind of companies. They actually added the most market cap uh, of any three sectors. And the only one to rival them was actually healthcare, as you can probably understand, producing vaccines and things like that. So what I want to highlight here is that these three areas, uh, 55 companies in total um, made up 55% effectively of the total companies which added the most market cap over the past six months. Um, the top one was Amazon. And uh, then there was a, a Chinese company at 50, which added 14.2 billion, which is still a very sizable amount. And even the, the, the smallest one, if you like, on this list of 100 was a company that added $8.2 billion in market cap just over the last six months. So we can see here that globally speaking, there's a huge opportunity in the ICT sector. Uh, it's, it's actually dominating all other sectors right now. When we look uh, for, for what's happening in China then, we can see that actually 25 of the companies of those 100 companies that added so much market cap in 2020 were Chinese. Not only were they Chinese, but those companies were primarily focused on China to generate their profit. Let's have a look here. Uh, of those 25 companies, 13 were in uh, what we call ICT. Um, information technology, communication, and computer uh, consumer discretionary. Uh, one healthcare, uh, Alibaba Health, uh, you might think that's a health provider, but it's not really. They're, they're not making vaccines or, or selling drugs or anything like that. It's also very closely related to, to ICT, actually. It's more data collection, sharing, and uh, big data, effectively. So what can we see from, from this slide? Uh, again, Basically, of the, the top 100 companies that grew, 25 were in China. And of those 25, 13 were actually in the IT, ICT sector, which also comes to around 55% actually of, the, of the, the total companies increasing market cap in the world. Um, the other thing I want to, to stress here is that most of these companies are focused on consumers rather than focused on B businesses, B2C rather than B2B. I think this is a theme that I'll come back to during this, uh, this presentation. So um, that's an opportunity, obviously. Who were these, uh, these companies? Let's look at the big ones first, the ones that managed to add the, the, the massive amounts of market cap and what they were doing. Names that everyone will recognize here, I think. Uh, Tencent, Pinduoduo, Meituan, uh, JD, Alibaba, of course. Um, all really doing e-commerce uh, or something very similar to e-commerce. Uh, the only exception here on this first page, which uh, managed to grow, grow uh, hugely and add a lot of market cap, was a company called NetEase. Um, this is online gaming. So we can't just say that their customers are in China. They're all over the world. So, so this one's a little bit of an exception. But apart from NetEase, all of these others were uh, consumer-oriented and uh, very much in the ICT sector. So we can say that discretionary consumer spending in China is driving the growth most of the growth for, for almost all of these companies. Um, therefore, we think that either directly or indirectly, Chinese consumers are representing the biggest and most accessible opportunity in this sector right now. What about the others? Uh, there were some smaller ones, we can say, certainly not as big as the giants there, but still very big. Uh, Shunfeng and ZTO, uh, these are logistics companies, of course, but their business is being driven by those same platforms. Uh, those online platforms and their business is growing extremely uh, fast in this uh, post-COVID uh, environment, obviously. Uh, then we have a company called China TDF. This is actually duty-free. Uh, they're selling duty-free products without Chinese people going abroad. I don't really know how this works. I don't want to talk about them, but they're a little bit exception here. But these bottom three, TAL, OffCN and GSX, all of them have added more than $8 billion of market cap in the past months. Uh, and each of them is involved in online education, primarily focusing on the Chinese education system, what we call K-12 over here. Um, and so uh, we can see that this online education within the ICT market is a particularly big focus. 
Um, I have a case study relating to this a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, we're going to move to, to Thomas now for one slide uh, to talk about regulatory challenges. Uh, and then we'll come back to, to myself to do the, the case studies. So, uh, Thomas, uh, I can control the slides here if you can uh, uh, take over for a few minutes. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to make one quick introduction of the challenges on regulation part when doing business, when doing business in China. We, we understand the topic is mainly related to the law and the regulation, but we also observe some uh, complexity here because it's also the mixture with technology as well. So um, we believe the first one, the uh, first thing we want to talk here is the challenge specific to the law. We call it CSL. And because this uh, CSL has defined or regulated some uh, very important principles about uh, uh, the security and the personal information protection and other matters. So uh, the first thing we want to, to measure here is the ICT uh, finding or ICT license. So for any uh, accessible um, website or system on internet in China, you must to pro uh, follow up the ISP filing process. So without the ISP filing, so your website will not be accessible. It will, it will be blocked by the ISP. But sometimes we also, uh, for some special companies, or, or they are doing some special uh, industry, so you would also need to evaluate whether ICP license is uh, required or not. So, uh, for example, like an e-commerce platform or some uh, data center or uh, uh, cloud computing, you really need to get one ICT license because it is fall into uh, the telecommunication business permit uh, category. Uh, one very important thing uh, about ICT license is you, you have to make one evaluation on your business model and your business type first because uh, only a domestic company and a joint venture company can be allowed to request the ICT license. So uh, before you enter into the China and start your business, <clears throat> you, manage to, you, you are planning uh, your new entity structure in China. You have to make consideration about next for ICT license. Well, the, for the second one, the market never protects skin. Uh, it's not one new thing that actually has been published about uh, uh, five or ten years ago. Uh, but in the last year, in 2019, there are new standards uh, have been published for, for this. So every company, when they have their own uh, system or website running in China, they have to hire one extra company to make one secure audit for, for their system to make sure uh, the system can meet the, the security requirements from the government side. And for some uh, big companies, uh, for, especially for the B2C uh, companies, when they uh, have a large size of the, uh, the consumers, uh, especially for the personal information data from the Chinese citizen, then the, the person data part uh, will be requested to store and receive in, in many of China. And in specific situations, you, if you have to uh, transfer off data uh, from China to, uh, to our countries, you have to follow up one special uh, approval process for, for that. And uh, of course, it's, it, it's one, uh, also one important fact to consider because uh, it's very important for you to plan your IT infrastructure for your business. So we, we understand for uh, many uh, foreign companies when they have in their branch office in China, they would just uh, uh, that French office in China to uh, keep utilizing um, IT infrastructure hosting in headquarters. Uh, but uh, with this condition, so if a large size of personal information being collected, then you can't utilize the, um, the infrastructure in, in headquarters now. You have to consider to set for a step along IT infrastructure in China to, for, for, comp for compliance purposes. Um, and, Sorry, uh, Thomas, all, can yeah. I request that you hold the mic nearer to yourself? Because uh, some attendees say they hear some echo. Hold the mic nearer to yourself.
sorry, um, let's give Thomas a little moment to sort out the sound quality so that we can all have a better experience. Problem, problem now? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, much better. <clears throat> okay, so uh, may offer some uh, special companies if they are stepping into some uh, special industry like the energy or, or, uh, or some other industry which being considered very important for the, for the country and for the so, uh, whole society. Their system or, uh, would be considered one critical information infrastructure. If it follow, if your system is fall into this category, then there are, will be much more complex and restricted uh, security control and map has been uh, will be requested. So, it, so we'll get the whole business process is more uh, complex. Okay. So let, let's uh, the based on the, some something about the CSL. So now we are going to uh, have a quick talk about the cryptography law. This is is one new law which is just in, in effective from the uh, January first of two twenty twenty. Um, so basically, this law defines the whole uh, cryptography into three categories. The first one, the core uh, cryptography. The second one is the ordinary. Uh, cryptography and the third one is the commercial cryptography. So basically, the, the former two will be treated as one state secret. So, and in that situation, so there will be a very complex um, administration process on it. Uh, but the good thing is, uh, for the commercial cryptography part, uh, the government will uh, have one notion control on it. And, uh, and there will be no identification on the use of the uh, commercial cryptography. But, but if your company is, uh, is selling or producing the commercial cryptography products, then you need to have pay more attention on this before uh, stepping into this field in China. Uh, okay, let me continue. Okay. So our last thing is about data privacy. So for now, uh, China doesn't have one universal uh, pro, uh, personally for information protection now, like the GDPR, but we, uh, we have seen uh, there are some many uh, other uh, regulation and standards related to the uh, personal information protection have been published in the past uh, two or three years. And we also see uh, uh, the, the several campaigns being, uh, being made by government in the last year to hit the activity which uh, abusing the personal information and there are even some uh, criminal uh, case for people. And um, that's one uh, famous case is about one IPO uh, uh, case. One, one IP service company, they are going to apply IPO that it, it, it was reject. And one of the big, uh, the important reason is a little company's mobile app application is trying to collect the uh, many personal information more than the uh, the purpose of this uh, mobile application. So the, the government will reject this IPO uh, application. Um, there are also some standards about uh, uh, how to design your, uh, your privacy in your application and how to uh, write, write your, your privacy statement or, or, or privacy policy. There are a lot of templates and the very detailed. So uh, I believe for the companies when they are uh, planning to do um, some IT business in, in China, so the data privacy issue is very is getting more and more important. And uh, lastly, we, we believe uh, the most important thing or most challenging thing for uh, for the company when it's doing business in China is they, they have to deal with uh, multi multi different. Uh, a department or, or, or supervised authority. Uh, for example, we have the CAC, uh, which is the top uh, and the most powerful uh, department on the ICT part. But this department just uh, gives some comment or strategy guidelines. But in the, in the real practice, you have to deal with a different department like the um, MIT or even the MTS. And if you are also going into some uh, specific interest like the financial 
uh, or education or, or press games, then you get uh, extra free approval from related authority. So, so overall, so we, we believe it's one, it's one really difficult or, or complex for the company when, when they uh, plan the business in China and have to deal with uh, all of the uh, complex requirements. And, and finally, uh, we, we got, when we prepare this a, a presentation, we get this news on the, uh, Adam can, can, okay. And on, on, the, on the June uh, 20th, we, 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 we got the new, uh, uh, this news is that the, uh, the Congress, the National People's Congress had uh, included the, the personal information protection law and also data security law into the in the now 2020 national uh, plan. So we believe in, in uh, maybe in the late in the next year or even maybe in the late of this year, we would say that the new central uh, centralized and universal law about the personal information protection. Uh, I think the good thing is we, we have the uh, we it, it might simplify uh, simplify our uh, complex process. Um, but the bad thing it could be that there might be more uh, complex requirements. Okay, so uh, so I believe this one, um, what overall is a quick instruction about the uh, regulatory challenges in, uh, in China when doing business. Okay, so I will hand it back to Evan. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Thomas. We uh, highlighted that section first because these three case studies that I'm gonna talk about now, uh, the, the background to them, of course, is the regulatory challenges that exist. So I'd like to explain three specific sectors. Um, first, starting off with a tough sector for foreign investment here, um, cloud computing and what we call uh, infra infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, uh, effectively. And uh, in China, we can see here are the main players. Um, you can see that most of them are domestic companies, but uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, has made substantial inroads into this market, and Microsoft down in eighth is getting into it as well here. Uh, but nevertheless, it's dominated by domestic companies in China, which probably is not the, the, the situation outside or in most countries. Um, the regulatory challenge here for companies like AWS and, and MS is that they're obligated by Chinese laws to operate their China cloud strategy as a JV. Um, and this touches on what Thomas was mentioning earlier relating to the ICP license and the telecommunications uh, restrictions. AWS is working with uh, Synnet and NWCD, whereas Microsoft's partner is a Chinese company called 21 Bionet. What I want to, to highlight here is that because of these regulatory restrictions in this particular sector, uh, for instance, Microsoft, um, they've actually had to develop separate project products for China, um, which they have to sell through their China JV. And, uh, and this is in addition to the standard global products that they sell all over the world. Uh, I'm sure they sell these in Singapore, for instance. Good examples are Azure and uh, M365. So, of course, many international businesses operating in China are choosing AWS or AMS, um, but it's, it's difficult for, to imagine that the local companies will choose that because there's, there's no particular benefits for them. And I'll explain a bit more why on the next slide. Here's a comparison um, about Microsoft M365 product being sold outside China and inside China and how it's different. Um, we're actually a reseller for, for Microsoft M365 outside of China, even though our clients are inside China. It's a little bit complex. I won't explain too much, but because we are, we, uh, we, we're pretty familiar with these differences. So for the global version, for instance, uh, probably many people are aware of, uh, of this product. It includes Microsoft Teams. It includes Microsoft Flow, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the global version is uh, purchased monthly and you can purchase it direct through the web or through CSP. You can buy it via a credit card and importantly, all the features in the global version are, are there by definition, obviously. Um, and the data centers behind this global version for Microsoft are all connected together. It's an integrated global product. Um, service provider is Microsoft themselves. Um, and in terms of if, if you are wanting to buy this global version in China, use it in China, I should say, it's not really possible to get an official invoice, a FAQIAO for this, which effectively increases the cost for, for companies in China uh, because they can't deduct it from their expenses uh, and therefore from their corporate income tax if they can't get the FAQIAO. 
Um, in contrast, the, the localized version of M365 is sold, a, uh, you have to buy a yearly license. Uh, typically you go to the reseller or web direct. You can pay via Alipay or, or via bank transfer, which wouldn't be possible for the global version, but its features are limited. Um, for instance, there's no Teams, uh, which is kind of very core to what a lot of international companies are, are requiring these days. And it's a different product. It's actually isolated from uh, Microsoft's other data centers around the world. Uh, why is it isolated? It's because of the uh, privacy laws, uh, the cybersecurity laws that Thomas was just mentioning that are specific to China. So Microsoft actually had to do this to comply. Um, the provider is actually 21 Bionet. And the Fa Piao, if you want to buy it in China, you actually get it via your local reseller. Um, so you can actually deduct it from your costs from tax purposes. So there's all these limitations uh, on Microsoft uh, relating to these products in China. So why is uh, Microsoft doing this? Um, as I mentioned, the ICP license has a limitation. They have to be involved in a uh, joint venture and they have these data localization requirements under cybersecurity laws. So therefore, while Microsoft is dealing with these regulatory challenges in this particular sector, uh, companies like Alibaba via their own platforms, DingTalk, etc. What they're doing is they're replicating and localizing much of this functionality within the China market. They're effectively catching up. Um, and so this is a, a tough area for, for foreign investments. And there are other examples, but I chose this one. Um, so we can say that the, the ICT market is a very broad one. Uh, and this particular area is uh, even difficult for the biggest companies in the world. Let's look at another one then, maybe one that's more feasible for Singaporean uh, investors joining the webinar today, uh, online education. This one is, uh, is complex, but it's accessible for foreign investment in China to a certain extent. Um, you probably all know that education's always been a difficult area for foreign investment in China. The Chinese government is worried about what is taught to its children, um, but certain activity is actually possible. In uh, online education sphere, it's possible for a foreign company to set up an entity and deliver a service through their platform in China. Uh, particularly if their clients are in China, uh, this will be uh, a good thing to do. However, uh, as they do that, they have to consider certain things with respect to, for instance, where will the servers be based and how will the Chinese users, uh, the consumers of their product ultimately access them? Um, I think we have Andy later speaking uh, about connectivity and this is really a practical issue on uh, how to, to effectively contact smoothly with your uh, students, if you like, or, or, or clients in China, where there is actually restrictions on data transfer inside and outside of China on the standard internet uh, connections that we can get in China. So it's a practical issue effectively. But there's also uh, compliance problems relating to uh, where is the personal data relating to these Chinese users going to be securely stored? Um, can they be stored outside? Can they be stored inside? Do you need a hybrid model if your main servers are outside and you find a connectivity solution? Uh, you need to consider this early on. Then um, who will be charged for the service provided and how to charge for the service? Why is this a consideration? Uh, well, direct provision of education services in China is restricted to foreign investment. However, if you're gonna uh, provide a tool to a, uh, an existing Chinese education company through which they provide their education service, well then maybe you can claim that you're, you're actually not providing an educational service. You're providing a, a, a tool to, to a, a company which is doing that, which could be okay in China. Uh, but this also will be a main consideration in how you structure your investment here. Thomas already talked about ICP filing or ICP license. I won't go through that again here, but uh, uh, all companies need to, to understand which area they fall into uh, when they are uh, investing in China in this area. In this particular sector, uh, this is a recent requirement since late 2019, uh, companies have to do a filing for uh, applications for online education provision. Uh, this is so the government uh, can monitor and uh, point out problems in, in any particular apps which are being used by, by Chinese students. So it's an extra compliance requirement. And at the same time as introducing this, uh, they also introduced the requirement to, for companies to do a MLPS filing. 
So to ensure that the data on this platform is actually protected to an adequate extent, I think it has to meet level three out of five in terms of the, uh, the uh, uh, level of security that the app can, can achieve. Uh, Des and Shira, we've been working with uh, companies in the online education sphere, and we have a, a US-based online education provider, which is asking us to help structure its business in China. So what are we doing? Uh, we're doing their, their cloud onboarding work uh, to set up the, the cloud structure for hosting their web applications. Um, this company actually decided that they would entirely replicate their, uh, their, their infrastructure in China on the Azure platform. So, so that's what we're doing for them. There's quite a bit of work in, involved in doing that. Uh, at the same time, we are managing their compliance. Um, ICP license analysis, we uh, finally uh, confirmed that they don't need this, but they do need to do the filing. Uh, the Public Security Bureau filing uh, with the government as well. The app for online education provision, we're still talking to them about whether they really need to do this or not. Uh, that will become clear soon, but if they do, we can do it for them and the MLPS. Uh, and then there's a lot of non-IT compliance around legal tax and HR, which we do, which I won't uh, get into in this particular slide. Um, but these are the considerations for this company. Here's another sub subsector, uh, the hospitality industry and online tools which can help uh, companies in this industry. So this is an example of a relatively accessible sector for foreign investment, relatively straightforward. Um, we're helping an Indian software company which has developed an app through which operations at the hotel, at hotels can be managed through their app effectively. Um, it's relating to, for instance, the cleaners or the front desk staff or all the, all the operational team really, but there's no sensitive data relating to the hotel guests on the app, which is, uh, makes it more straightforward. The main clients for this company are hotels owned by Chinese real estate companies, but operated by international hotel chains. So this company has already sold their product to international hotel chains in other countries around the world, including Singapore, uh, and those, those chains want to buy in China. However, the ultimate client in China uh, who pays them, who pays our, our clients, will be these China real estate companies that own the hotels. So uh, these companies require our, our client to have an entity in China to receive payments, to issue FAPIALs, as I just mentioned earlier, as well as to provide for physical support and training to employees in Chinese. So that's the, the challenge for our client. What we've done for this company um, is a little bit similar to what I just explained. We set up their entity in Shanghai. Um, based on their contract template that they would use in other markets, we put something together under PRC law in Chinese language that's suitable to use for its Chinese client base going forward. Um, we managed the ICP filing process. We handled the uh, accounting tax filing and issuance of the FAPIALs. We helped them hire their initial staff, uh, coordinated their training, uh, who coordinate the training and, the, and the, the everything else relating to the software in Chinese language. And uh, they also have to think about transfer pricing here because they're actually earn a, receiving quite a lot of money in China, but they've got very little people on the ground in China. So how do they actually get their cash out of China and uh, make sure they don't make a huge margin here and, and pay a huge amount of tax here? So we, we help them uh, structure that. Uh, each quarter, we uh, help them to send out their royalty fee payments to their overseas IP holder, and um, we do some special filings to help them do that. Okay, so, so there's uh, three particular areas where uh, foreign investment into ICT in China can either be difficult, complex, but possible, or relatively straightforward. I have, hope that gives you a guideline for whichever kind of companies that you are running for those who are listening. For the last few minutes, I'd just like to talk about tax incentives for eligible companies here in China in, in this area. Um, in China, the, the standard tax rate is 25% and losses can be carried forward for a maximum five years. Um, however, it's possible to get licenses or get um, preferential policies which can reduce that tax rate and or extend the loss carry forward limitation period. Uh, we can see four here uh, and how it works. And uh, let's just talk about them very quickly. This high and new tech enterprise is one. Um, you need to be a company in China. You need to have set up your entity in China, obviously. And you need to actually transfer IP to that entity. 
uh, and it has to be kind of core IP within the scope of high tech fields. This is really difficult for a lot of companies and it precludes a lot of companies from taking advantage of this particular preferential policy. Uh, also, the R&D expenditure needs to be a significant amount of uh, sales income. And finally, there's a requirement on the technical personnel. And uh, we have a, a ratio of income from high tech products against total income. Uh, this is a relatively high barrier for companies to, to get over to achieve this and get, get this preferential policy. But the difficult one is too, it's the IP actually transferring to the China entity. For this technically advanced service enterprises, TASES as we call them, this is easier. Uh, of course, it still has to be a resident enterprise. Um, and the services provided have to be technically advanced services within the field supported by the state. Um, the company still has to have this advanced technology and possess strong R&D capabilities, uh, which means that 50% of the headcount has to have a college degree and above. Um, and the uh, 50% or more of the total income should be coming from these advanced services. Uh, and also income derived from these source, offshore source, sorry, from these services should be offshore outsourcing services. So really these kind of companies are, are encouraged to do work with, com with clients outside of China and bring revenue into China. And it's for that reason that they get this um, preferential policy. There's another quick one I should introduce for those of you looking to set up maybe small companies uh, in China in the, in the coming years. The, uh, the tax incentives for these companies have been introduced relatively recently, which means that for companies with a headcount of less than 300 in China and who have assets amounting to less than 50 million renminbi, and taxable income no more than 3 million renminbi in a year, uh, they get a reduced corporate income tax rate of just 5% for the first 1 million uh, renminbi of uh, taxable income, and then 10% from the portion between 1 million and 3 million. Uh, as soon as you start earning more than 3 million renminbi in China, you'll be taxed at 25% uh, corporate income tax on all your profits, unless you get any of the pre uh, preferential policies that we just explained there. But uh, this is certainly a benefit for the smaller companies that are looking to uh, expand here in China in the coming years. Okay, I think we went over time there. Uh, sorry uh, for, for that if we did, um, but we look forward to answering uh, any questions that you have after the, the next presentation. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, I'd like to hand back to Ying Ying. Yeah, thank you, Adam. So coming up next, we have Andy, Head of Sales International at the China Broadband Communications. Andy has 20 years of experience in the telecommunication industry, where he worked with Singtel, AT&T and Vodafone, covering projects such as Internet of Things, Global Multi-Protocol Label Switching, Call Centers, Data Centers and Regional Mobility Deployment. Today, Andy will be sharing on networking in China, the new normal, covering the new way of communications after COVID-19. Businesses need to think about how to build a sustainable and robust network for their employees to work and communicate effectively within and beyond China. And they will be discussing the most commonly faced communication challenges of businesses operating in China, including challenges in managing the internet quality, assessing common SaaS in the cloud effectively, ensuring no operations downtime, and most importantly, to keep the cost low. Let's welcome Andy, please. Thank you, Ying Ying. And good morning to every, everyone, and thank you for taking time to be with us here today. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to share a little bit of a story uh, in terms of my journey with CBC so far. Uh, as you heard from Ying Ying, I have spent uh, 20 years in different tele telecom company, and this is my first time actually working for a Chinese company. And, and a little story that happened uh, during the circuit period, uh, circuit breaker period was that at the same time, I'm the head of sales of CBC. I'm also a co-founder uh, of a martial arts school in Singapore. Uh, it has been my passion since young uh, to practice martial art, and I did represent Singapore uh, back in 1997. So during the circuit breaker period, uh, I have a very I have an assistant instructor who is young, uh, 25 year old, coming to me and asking me, uh, you know, how how are we going to conduct our class our classes from now? So uh, we decided to conduct our qigong classes online. Uh, and he was trying to portray an image of the school online. He asked me this question, you know, and I, I actually, he asked me this question, what kind of image would you want to portray online? And immediately I, I gave back the answer uh, that I would like 
our school to have the same image as CBC, where uh, we are a competent school that we can uh, be competent in our teaching methods, as well as uh, providing warmth to our students. So, so that was really my, my true experience in coming to a Chinese company, and I've met so many uh, competent people here in this company uh, that not only are they competent, but at the same time, uh, very caring and uh, to really support our customers and employees. Uh, in Singapore terms, we actually call them like old birds, right? Uh, that have many years of experience in the telco industry. Uh, and I've met these people that are from Singapore, China and Hong Kong. Everyone is so eager to help. Uh, and as you will see later in the use cases, uh, you know, we, we came out during the COVID-19 period to really help our customers uh, turn up services within four days, uh, making decisions about ways of working during this pandemic. So for this, uh, today's session, I will be combining a pool of use cases, opinions uh, from various people, and hopefully this will help uh, our fellow customers, fellow Singaporeans, in having a view on how to design your network technology in the Chinese market. So, as many of you know, China is a big uh, domestic market today. They are, in fact, the second largest economy in the world right now, uh, with 14 trillion US dollar. If you look at the population itself, currently rising at 1.42 billion, but what is more interesting is the netizen, right? The amount of people going online, buying stuff, uh, selling stuff at the same time, uh, close to 900 million people are doing that. So to many MNCs out there, it is really a market whereby huge potential, but also at the same time, a market for production, a market for uh, aspiring to become the world leader. And one very important, interesting fact is that they are, in fact, at the moment, the largest trade partner of Singapore. Uh, and we are looking to see how we can help uh, the forum here to, to connect even better uh, between Singapore and China. Now, I'm going to show you a very interesting landscape. Uh, if you just look at this map alone, 23 provinces uh, to five autonomous regions, uh, special administrative regions, etc. We're not trying to give you a geography lesson here, but rather what we're trying to showcase here is that there are differences in terms of the contracting uh, arrangement, uh, the regulation, even in the telecom networking world. Uh, the third party arrangement, uh, different legislation, uh, different data protection act as what uh, Adam and uh, Thomas reiterated earlier on. So the landscape in the telecom uh, market in China is very interesting whereby they are, they are classified into uh, carriers, tier one, tier two, uh, and some others. Uh, but CBC basically we are in A, we will consider ourselves a tier two carrier. We have the A2 license, right? Um, and many enterprises are now struggling, or should I say, uh, redesigning because of the complex regulatory uh, environment, uh, particularly the cybersecurity law that was um, amended back in 2018. Uh, but that doesn't mean that your operations cease to, your operations stop, right? we will be able to provide you with uh, solutions and uh, design that actually help you to legally assess uh, some of these web-based web -based applications. And I think the other concern here is also, when you look at some of these web-based applications that is listed here, such as AWS, uh, Office 365, Teams, really the issue to many of our customers today is about the, uh, the quality. Right? Many of the customers that come to us it's not that they cannot assess Office 365 or, or you know, the AWS Cloud. It's really uh, the latency, the packet drop, uh, the, the access to all these different web-based applications. And we have a way to help you to enhance it. And we will show, th show that to you in some of the use cases that we have compiled. So before we jump into the networking landscape, I just want to give a very one-page uh, intro uh, of CBC. Uh, we are one of the leading managed uh, service provider in China today. Uh, on the left-hand side, you will actually see 
what I call the competency, right? The, the, the technology part of the company where we are very heavily invested in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, continuing R&D team. It's very rare today, in fact, uh, to see a telco company continuing to have an R&D team that is investing in the future technology and researching into future ways of networking. On the right hand side, you will actually see the people side of things, right? Where we have uh, the professional uh, team. As I mentioned earlier on, we have a pool of international people, right? From cell build run, from sales, uh, from delivery, from service, you know, that have worked with many international MNCs before. And many of our people are actually world-class certified uh, capabilities. Just a quick uh, view of the pops and the points of presence that we have both in China and internationally. We wanted to make sure that our customers, because we understand that today we are not only serving the Chinese market, but rather uh, companies that are investing into China. So we have many customers today, uh, ranging from US to European, uh, to even Singaporean companies. Uh, one of the top Singaporean companies is actually our key customer today. Now, the kind of network that you actually need uh, in terms of entering China. I will first start with this uh, common topic. In China, there is a common term on the ground. We say yitiao long, right? Meaning a one-stop shop service. Uh, simply because today when you want to enter into China, you need somebody who actually understands the landscape, right? It's not just about providing the network to you, but it's also about making sure that your business is compliant, your local sites, your branches, right? They are compliant in terms of connecting up with the rest of the world. Secondly, cost effectiveness is very important. Uh, in, in China today, it is a very competitive market. If you are selling in that local market, you need to be cost effective in terms of your own internal cost. And network, network is part of that internal cost, all right? Um, speed, the speed to market, uh, again, very relevant here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, the, uh, the Chinese culture is that we always are doing things very fast for our customer so that the customer can be agile within the Chinese market. So deployment uh, is definitely one of the top priority uh, that our company look into together with our customer. Uh, and of course, you need to be able to connect to different branches, data center, headquarter, different system, different web-based uh, uh, applications. And last but not least, ensuring that the network that you have today must be secure, right? Uh, uh, good, good data protection, firewall uh, against all of this. So one of the things that I want to just put it into a layman term for, for you guys, if you, if you were to think about the internet today, right, the internet world um, is basically data, you know, data packets uh, that looks like cars and buses that is trying to go within a pipe. Um, and without proper organize, organization of how this data is going to flow, this is what, what is going to happen. Okay, within, within the internet world. But with proper conduct, conducting of the traffic, you will see a smooth flow. Uh, and therefore, what, what that means to you is that your end user experience, whether they are on Microsoft Teams or they are assessing uh, Office 365, they will have a better end user experience. As what is seen here, you get a good flow of uh, traffic. So in fact, Many analysts today are already saying that the next generation network, not just for China, not just within China, but also uh, connecting most of the international site is SD-WAN technology. Okay, and we'll describe uh, what is that to you in a, in a few minutes through some of the use cases. So for the technical people on this forum, you probably will be able to understand this slide a little bit better. Um, we, are, we are basically, defining what is SD-WAN technology. Uh, typically, we use a cross-border uh, internet uh, and there will be a centralized management of what we call the orchestration layer uh, that basically orchestrate uh, the data transmission within the underlay. 
So the overlay and the underlay. And if you were to look at that, how that transform into a real case scenario will be, uh, it could be a US MNC or Singapore company with the headquarters here in Singapore, all right, connecting into the SD-WAN, assessing your factories in China, assessing your partners and clients, uh, as well as your consumer who are assessing your website uh, via, the, uh, via their, their mobile or their mobile devices and also your internal employees assessing web application like Office 365 uh, and Microsoft Teams. So with that said, let's take a look at some of the case studies uh, that we have in place uh, for you today. Now this is a very interesting one, very close to my heart, uh, because when I, when I first joined CBC, you know, it was one of the, it happened during uh, February, uh, where China was on complete lockdown. And if you can and if you were to imagine this, uh, 700 billion people going into a lockdown situation, all working from home, all trying to assess the internet uh, within China. You can imagine the amount of burden that is being put on uh, on the Chinese uh, in, you know, internet load. During that period, uh, this US MNC were actually experiencing 10 to 20% of packet loss when all of their users were trying to assess from home. So what we did was we come in, uh, within, in fact, within four days, within four days, we identified the issue. Uh, we, we helped them to troubleshoot uh, and we provided a service uh, that effectively cut the packet loss to 1%. And with that, the customer of their end user within China was able to assess Office 365 and some of uh, the web-based application like Salesforce, for example, much more effectively. And all this was done within four days, uh, even with contract signed within four days. Now, a little bit about uh, companies entering into uh, China and they need access you know, and, uh, into not just the international uh, cloud application, uh, they also need to assess a domestic cloud as well, uh, such as RDUIN, et cetera, uh, in order to you know, rather be with interaction with their partners, their customers. Uh, so that is the kind of uh, network complexity that they have. Uh, and there was very, for this particular customer, you know, it was a manufacturing plant uh, that effectively have very bad access uh, into Microsoft 365 and Azure. Uh, and because of the heavy investment on MPLS, uh, they didn't have a strategy uh, to, to really deploy uh, their service, their locations within China. Uh, when we met them, we had a discussion and we redesigned the whole network for them uh, using our SD-WAN solution. And we were able to split the traffic between uh, the local internet as well as the uh, international web-based application, All right? So, and this became not only an effective solution, we also greatly reduced the cost for this particular customer. Now, the third use case is another very interesting one, uh, which is a European jewelry brand, as you know, the Chinese uh, have become more fluent. They have a lot of spending power. Uh, this particular jewelry brand has set up retail branches across China, almost uh, 30 branches in China itself. Uh, they, the, the branches need to assess data from their headquarters, right? So this is a very typical uh, scenario where branches versus headquarters. Right. How, do we, how do we bring that connection uh, to an effective level such that they get uh, their kind of effective connectivity? Um, so do think about this as a Singaporean company. If you have your headquarters here in Singapore, how are you going to communicate with your branches, with your factories uh, back, back in China? All right. Similarly, what we did was uh, we consolidated all of their sites, all of their 30 sites. Is in fact, one of our uh, uh, most important customer today within China. Uh, we consolidated all of that and we were able to provide a congestion-free uh, channel. Uh, so why we say congestion-free is because CBC is effectively uh, a provider that does not serve the consumer space. Uh, as some of the telcos in China, 
do they still have they, they still have to serve the consumer space they have the consumer license but we only have the enterprise license which is in a way a good news to our enterprise customer because that means that the pipe the infrastructure that we have is built solely for our enterprise customer all right uh, and when we did that for this particular jewelry brand straight away they experienced very good connectivity all the way back uh, into 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 europe uh, where their headquarters is uh, and they they have access uh, in terms of you know the branches have access to all the different kind of application be it web based or applications that sits in the server within europe now the last case study uh, will be a little bit more complex in the sense that we are talking now about uh, data security. Okay. A very typical setup uh, internationally that what people do is that we always put the firewall in front uh, on-prem, uh, when we say on-prem meaning on-site, uh, where we have headquarters, we have offices, factories, we have uh, critical data you know, that, um, that you want to prevent uh, people from hacking, uh, you want to prevent people from taking information uh, from your headquarters, from your remote offices, and, and hence the presence of uh, firewalls and antivirus software. Now, all these can be very expensive. Imagining if you were to deploy multiple instances uh, on, on multiple locations, right? If you have 30 branches, you're going to deploy 30 firewalls throughout 30 branches uh, in China. This is a very expensive way uh, of conducting your business. Right. When this customer came and talked to us, uh, what we did again was not only did we provide the network layer that, as, as we spoke earlier on, about congestion-free traffic for our customer, at the same time, we provided network security with, within the cloud itself, meaning that all the security layer is, is being done uh, in, in the cloud. Therefore, the customer does not have to in, invest into instances in each of the offices itself. And in this way, they actually achieve a lot of cost saving from the hardware. Um, they, they save operational costs because all the maintenance and operation support is now being done by CBC and not done on site, you know, where they have to hire 30 different people on each side. So with that, we, we come to um, this last slide uh, where we want to share with you not so much of um, CBC itself, but rather when you think about uh, the, the network partner that you need to work with, all right, you need to really think about um, these four areas. First of all, as I mentioned, a one-stop shop really is to find a partner that understand the local market uh, that can really help you to be compliant. Uh, there are many various ways that we can, uh, first of all, help you to assess certain web-based application. Secondly, we can help you to uh, enhance the experience of the web-based application, right? So these are important points that you need to look out for uh, when working with a particular partner. And I think uh, from a CBC perspective, we can confidently say that we are able uh, to satisfy all of these areas in, in the cases that we have shown you earlier on. So, with that, I would like to open up uh, for any questions that you might have, and we would like to uh, help you look into more of these scenarios of your business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. So now we will proceed to the Q&A session for both speakers. If you have any questions for uh, Adam, Thomas, Andy, please uh, type into the Q&A uh, box, and I will do the moderation for you. So right now I see a few questions in the Q&A box. So Stephen asks, what is the best way to enter China market as, an, as a Singapore IT company? So maybe Adam, would you like to take this question? Yes. What is the best way to enter China market as a Singapore IT company? Yes, thank you. Very thank open you. question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Stephen. I think uh, I can only say case by case for, for this I mean, it really depends on the, the nature of what you're doing in IT, as we mentioned. Are you in the tough area, like Microsoft and AWS, or are you towards the, the hospitality area, like uh, the, the, the app that I explained there? 
I would say the best way, if you can do it, is to take complete control of your entity through our, what we call a wholly foreign-owned enterprise, a WUFI. Uh, if you can do that, then, then yes, that, that gives you complete control. Um, if you can't, or if you feel that you'll need a partner in China to, to do it with for whatever reason, then JVs are also an option, but they just tend to be harder to control. Um, and of course, yeah, you can't make as much money because you have to share your profit. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm afraid just to say case by case, but most of the companies we work with, I can say are, are entering via this uh, Wufi, uh, wholly foreign owned enterprise model. Okay, maybe I can help um, Stephen dissect the question a little bit further. So are there any specific regions in China that have preferential policies maybe for the ICT sector? or maybe more beneficial for ICT sector? Yes, I mean, there, there are regions. For instance, the, the Western regions of China these days are, are um, giving out these preferential policies basically to attract uh, investment into their regions. So you can look at investing in those areas, but it doesn't necessarily mean that even if you invest in those regions, you have to have all your people uh, actually based in those uh, regions. For instance, you could set up in a place like Chongqing um, maybe have a, a basic infrastructure there and some people there. But if your market is going to be Shanghai and Shenzhen and Beijing, where of course most of your clients are likely to be, then you can have employees in those cities as well. So, so that's one option. Um, and there's also other options, for instance, free trade zones or free trade areas. Shanghai has a free trade area, which um, actually allows 100% uh, ownership or at least more than 50% ownership on these JV companies uh, that would be restricted elsewhere. Um, however, one thing I'd like to warn everyone that's listening here is that even though those free trade areas, uh, in theory, allow companies to circumnavigate the rules on, on restrictions on foreign ownership, uh, in practice, it's very difficult to get those business licenses. So it's case by case again. Um, but certainly one option is to, to go to the less developed areas of China, set up there, and then use that as a base to expand within China. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see a question from Yvonne asking about uh, policy and regulations in the cybersecurity space. So uh, recently there's this new regulation for companies who want to acquire Chinese certifications. Maybe Thomas, would you like to take this question? Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for, uh, thank you for, for asking this question. So uh, firstly, uh, you, I noted your message some uh, PKI uh, token, so we, we, we think that it, it could be related to the, the cryptography law, I, I just mentioned the PPT. So, and you also mentioned the, your, your end user, what customer could be the, the banks. And banks, uh, the system usually will be treated as one critical information infrastructure in China. So it means there will be more complex and restricted restrictions on that. Um, so, so first thing, so I, I think your your technology uh, or your uh, product you should be um, applied for allow allowed to use in China. Uh, if you are, maybe you can, for example, you, you can try to cooperate with one of the partner and uh, the partner pay the license fee to you uh, and uh, then the local partner can resell your product to an, an customer. Uh, in that situation, your local partner need to, uh, uh, to apply a, uh, uh, importing license to, for, for your product to, to, to sell and use it in China. And uh, the second way could be um, you, you, you can consider to set your own legal entity and uh, your, your legal entity to apply for the, the import license and the deal with the, uh, the case with client directly. So I, I think both ways could be okay, but of course, uh, the, we, it's related to the, some CII from uh, the requirement. It will be, uh, we, we need to evaluate case by case, uh, get more information and uh, evaluate how to uh, operate it. Mm. Yeah, maybe I can just add on my end that I think this one, this particular case falls into the, uh, the second category that I was introducing in the case studies. Uh, complex, but possible in terms of foreign investment in China. But there are more, more hoops to jump through basically for such a company. But um, yeah, we can, we can help companies to do that kind of stuff. And we are helping companies to do that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Amos. He's asking whether um, they are currently selling to government bodies and their solution is moving to cloud. So maybe Andy, would you like to take this question? They're asking whether 
if they would mm -hmm. need to move their solution to available to be available on private cloud. I assume he's asking about government private cloud. Okay, so uh, with regards to that, right, the, the government bodies actually have a uh, separate uh, firewall uh, by themselves. Uh, that is, they essentially do not uh, work with providers like ourselves. Uh, we, we do not support the government sector. There is a, um, a separate uh, pool of uh, telecom company that actually works on the government sector itself. So for that, uh, they will probably have to inquire with, uh, with because in, the, in China, the, the government is very sensitive about their information. Right? So that is actually a separate pool of people. Okay, understood. Thank yeah. you. So we have a question from Navin. Uh, we are a Singapore SME, which is currently in the process of finalizing an arrangement with a US company specializing in project management solutions, both the server and cloud-based offerings to present them for Asia. The solution is largely used by technology, telcos, and software development enterprises for project management. So, uh, Navin has three, has three questions. So, is there any knowledge around this area, any potential uh, for such a product, for project management product? Any uh, concerns about IP, IP project protection? Or if there's any specific uh, market entry strategy that any one of you could share? So I think this question cuts across. Uh, would Andy, would you like to take this question? Okay, I think um, importantly for an SME looking into, uh, first of all, is the is the ICP filing, right? That that part is very important. Uh, we do help our customers in terms of uh, the ICP filing. Uh, we do provide uh, some of support uh, for for the customer. Uh, from a project management. Uh, standpoint is a product that, that supports project management within the yeah. company. It's company. like an IT solution for project management. I see. Okay. So I think the, the main part that we can come in is that uh, how, how does your application, uh, how do you provide this application uh, to the customer? Right? From a connectivity standpoint, we, we could then help them uh, to basically connect uh, from the customer sites into whether back into the server or be it back into the cloud itself, depending on where, where are they hosting it, right? So a common scenario will be uh, most of this uh, software as a service uh, provider, they provide it you know, in the AWS cloud. Uh, we have direct access, we are a carrier neutral um, uh, company. So when Adam earlier on mentioned about um, AWS uh, being in one of the north in, uh, in Beijing and also uh, Microsoft is with uh, 21 net we have access to both. Uh, we provide the connectivity into both the cloud itself. Okay, thank you. Adam and Thomas, do you have anything to add for this question? Yes, I think I can add from my side that the, the potential must be very large here, uh, project management tools for these kind of companies. As I started the presentation with uh, the companies in China that are growing the most and, and adding the most value are precisely those kind of companies. And uh, they are lacking those kind of tools. So I think there's huge potential here. Uh, in terms of a, a market access strategy, uh, it seems to me that this kind of tool could be uh, falling into the relatively, like the case study three that I presented, relatively straightforward, not as difficult as the one that was just introduced previously relating to banks and critical information infrastructure. Of course, we would have to understand more, but it sounds like relatively straightforward to access the, the Chinese market directly by setting up a company and, and uh, selling this product. And in terms of IP protection, uh, that should be something that you do very early on, basically. Uh, otherwise, other people will, will steal that and it's a common problem. So, so protecting your IP is something really to do very, at the very beginning of any, uh, any strategy to enter this market. Even if you don't want to enter this market, uh, but you want to identify distributors uh, to license your product to, make sure you've protected the IP first as well. Okay. So uh, I have a question from Kevin. Uh, given the upcoming Chinese data protection laws and the personal information security specifications, uh, Kevin's company offers both training and software for compliance to data protection. Do you foresee any opportunities in terms of partnerships and clients for this area to provide data protection, training and compliance? I, maybe I can comment on that one as well. Um, 
yes, this sounds like more like a consulting company. So uh, if you feel you're, you have enough knowledge of these, these laws in China and you can explain them to, to, to clients and it's a particular speciality in terms of the IT side, um, that the, I think there's a, a lack of these companies being able to do this in China right now for multinationals. And there's definitely a, a requirement for those multinationals. So I would, I would say yes. Okay. So, uh, Gyok Tan, you're saying that uh, competition in China can be very severe. So, what are the bright spots? What are the areas with the most potential? And is, are there any areas that they should avoid? Be it in terms of industry sectors or maybe markets? Uh, yeah. Adam? Again, I was going to say, okay, um, yes, I mean, my, my presentation was, was pointing out that the consumer market in China is, is enormous and, and very profitable. Um, Chinese consumers have much higher disposable income than they used to, and, and there's just a lot of Chinese people. But uh, like you, you can see the, 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 the platforms that are mainly servicing them are domestic Chinese companies. So I think that the, the case studies that, sorry, the, the, the questions that have come in so far from the audience about their products that they can sell them either to Chinese domestic companies that are already servicing those markets, for instance, the Chinese banks, or for instance, for the project management tool, those, those IT companies, Chinese IT companies directly, that's, uh, that's a big opportunity. So basically indirectly taking advantage of the Chinese consumers, if you like, uh, or even the other, the other question, which was around selling to international companies that want to uh, figure out their, their, their concerns over uh, like private information requirements in China, things like this. These indirect methodologies are probably more uh, likely to, to be uh, achievable by uh, Singaporean companies which don't have the kind of resources like AWS or Microsoft has. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, so now maybe we will take the last question from Yvonne. So there are a mobile app security company in the cybersecurity space in Singapore. So what may be the possible process for setting up an entity in China? Or are there any partners they can work with? Would Andy, would CBC be a potential partner for cybersecurity companies to set up in China? Andy? Yes, I think cybersecurity is definitely one of the uh, largest uh, topic today, uh, especially with the cybersecurity act in place as well. Uh, today, we, we do have a sister company, uh, which is Early on, we mentioned about the use uh, case uh, where we provide uh, network, network security, right? particularly in the area of network security. Because cyber security is uh, uh, very wide, right? You can, you can protect the security from a different layer. Uh, we look at it from a network perspective. So I do think that uh, for Yvonne, uh, if you're looking for a partner to work with, uh, there, there could be some potential there, uh, depending on how you're approaching it. Okay, so uh, I believe there are still a few questions that uh, the audience have for the panelists. So uh, we will stay on for a little while more. So we have come to the end of the first session of our Entering China series. Uh, the next webinar will be on 13 July on partnerships. And the, the, the third session will be on 23rd July covering IP protection. Yeah, so do sign up through um, our QR code, which I will share. Yeah, so do sign up through the links over here. Uh, the link can also be found in the chat uh, under the Astrotech events page. Yeah, so at the same time, I also like to uh, reiterate that we are doing a survey on internationalization. So please fill up the survey for us to understand you better so that we can cater more specific events, um, activities to help you grow. Yeah, thank you all once again for joining us today. Uh, so I will leave this session open a little while more in case you have further questions for our panelists. Do continue to ask in the Q&A uh, section and we will let the panelists uh, answer you by typing in directly to the, to the questions. Thank you.